This session here in Romans 4 is Hot Knives Through Butter, Bypassing Automated Analysis Systems with Zhong Bu and Abhishek Singh. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining this session. I appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you know Barnaby Jack. Uh, so right, right now, in another room, there's a memorial event going on to memorize him. And, uh, you know, so I just want to take this time and basically express my feelings about him. He and I were co-workers. You know, he's, he's my ex-co-worker in McAfee, McAfee Labs. And he's a true inspiration to me and to m many of us. Um, you know, he will, he will be missed for sure. Okay, so let's, you know, uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Abhishek to begin this session. Uh, thank you, Jung. In uh, 2011, we, we were seeing close to 80,000 samples per day. And in 2013, uh, currently we are seeing close to 200,000 200, samples per day. It is quite obvious that we won't have to end up analyzing all the 200,000 uh, samples. We have like a generic and the heuristic based uh, signatures which have capability of catching unknown uh, samples. And uh, besides uh, heuristic and uh, generic uh, signatures, um, many times we see new variant of a known family of uh, malware. So if we have an advanced classification algorithm <laughs> we can easily catch a new variant of a known family of uh, malware. However, still, amount of samples what we are seeing per day is huge. Now, in order to be able to say if the files what we are seeing is good or bad, uh, one approach uh, can be to use a human analyst. On an average, the human analyst will take like close to 30 to 45 minutes of research, and after which he can easily say, that the file of what he's seeing is good or bad. And with the exponential growth of the unknown sample, this is not sca scalable. The other approach, which is uh, currently being used by AV industry, is to use a file-based uh, sandbox. A typical architecture of a, a file-based uh, sandbox is as shown in the figure. It has traps at a uh, various uh, level. It has application a trap, it has trap at a kernel, it has a trap at a CVU. It takes the file as an input, it executes these uh, files, these files make calls to different uh, functions, and when these calls are being made, these calls are being captured by these traps, and a sandbox uh, monitoring unit will uh, convert these calls into the behavior. Once we have the behavior of the file, then an analyst will be able to say if the file is a good, bad, is a good file or a bad file. If the file is uh, malicious, signatures can be uh, generated and those can be uh, deployed. Now the question comes, the amount of samples what we are seeing per day, is it really being captured by a file-based uh, sandbox? The answer is no. All the samples what we are seeing uh, uh, not all the samples of what we are seeing uh, per day uh, can easily be uh, caught by a file-based uh, sandbox. And uh, this is the whole uh, presentation is all about. We have uh, broadly uh, cl cl classified the evasion techniques into uh, four parts. In the first part, we have evasion uh, techniques which make use of human interaction. In the second part, we have evasion techniques which make use of configuration issues. Then we talk about the classic uh, techniques. These classic techniques, they have been uh, discussed in information uh, security space, but we still see a considerable amount of uh, samples which still uh, make use of these uh, techniques. And last but not the least, we have environment-specific evasion uh, techniques. File-based uh, sandbox, they emulate a physical uh, system which lack human interaction. And this fact has been used to develop evasion uh, technique. Uh, this is a quote from Trojan Upclicker, which was uh, observed by us in December 2012. It uh, makes a call to the function set Windows hook EX 
And in that uh, function, it passes the parameter 0 EH. By pa passing this uh, parameter, it hooks to the mouse activity, after which the code has a switch case uh, function uh, call. Only when the left uh, mouse button is clicked up, it unhooks from uh, mouse activity and uh, makes a call to the malicious uh, code. Besides hooking to a uh, mouse, uh, Windows executable has also been seeing, uh, making use of a uh, message box at uh, message box EX API to create uh, dialog uh, boxes. And only when these dialog boxes are uh, clicked, uh, malicious activity uh, takes place. The human interaction is not uh, limited to a Windows executable. It is also being seen in uh, PDF uh, files. As shown in the screen, uh, this is the code of uh, malicious uh, JavaScript. It makes use of app alert API to pop up a, a dialog uh, box. And only when the dialog box is uh, clicked, uh, malicious activity uh, takes place. The goal of the sandbox is to uh, mimic the environment uh, provided uh, by an actual uh, computer. And in order to be able to do so, it has a predefined set of parameters. Uh, again, with the amount of uh, samples what we are seeing uh, per day, the file base uh, sandbox can give only a certain amount of time to a, 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 to a particular uh, uh, file. Uh, now to bypass the configuration issues, one of the things of what we have seen is like extended a sleep call. If the sample is sleeping for an extended a time, then it can refrain itself from capturing of its behavior by the sandbox during its um, monitoring activity. This is the code from a Trojan a nap. A Trojan a, a, a nap is the revived uh, version of Kalios uh, botnet which was claimed to be uh, taken down. As shown in the code, it makes a use of sleep EX API with a 10 uh, minute uh, timeout. It also has to be seen that alterable uh, value in this code is set to false. So the code will sleep uh, whatsoever uh, may happen. Besides uh, using sleep EX API, Undocumented APIs like NT delay execute can also be used to have extended sleep calls. Again, the sleep calls, they are not uh, confined to Windows executable. It has also been seen in case of uh, JavaScript inside a, a PDF a file. As shown in the screen, it makes use of app set timeout API with a 16 uh, minute timeout. And only after the timeout, it uh, makes a call to the malicious uh, function. The time uh, trigger or the time bombs, these are a very specific uh, sample. This particular uh, sample was being used to uh, wipe out uh, drives of computers in uh, Korea. The whole execution step in this case can be uh, broadly divided into two parts. As a part of the first step, it makes use of the API get a local time to get the current time. If the current time is uh, less than the detonation time, then a sample uh, makes a call to the sleep uh, function with 60 seconds uh, timeout. It then again checks if the current time is equivalent to the detonation time. The moment a current time becomes equivalent to the detonation time, a uh, sample will execute. It is quite obvious that if a time triggered a sample are being dropped inside a file based sandbox before their detonation a time, it won't execute and it can easily uh, prevent itself from capturing of its uh, behavior. Uh, this is one of the very sophisticated piece of a code which was observed in uh, push two. As shown in my previous slide, the file based uh, sandbox, they have to capture the, all the uh, behavior. Uh, Microsoft uh, provides kernel routine PSP set create process uh, notify a routine to allow security software to be able to uh, 
monitor the process uh, creation and deletion of the files. As such, there is no publicly disclosed uh, method for a third party application to be able to register for these uh, notifications. In case of a, a push to, what it did was that it very specifically checked for the build uh, number. When it got the build uh, number, it checked for the very specific opcodes, a move EDI and push EDI. As shown in the code of uh, Windows, after a move EDI and just before push EDI, we have the address of the PSP set, a PSP set create process a notify a routine. So once it has been able to locate that address, it directly jumps to that address and it, it will set all the callbacks to null. So now if any new process is getting created or uh, deleted, there won't be any notification. Uh, uh, besides these uh, techniques, we have also observed a considerable amount of uh, classical uh, techniques. As such, uh, these uh, techniques have been discussed uh, multiple times, so we don't plan to go too deep into uh, these uh, techniques. Uh, Many times, the file-based sandbox are very particular and specific to a vendor. And if they are very specific to a vendor, there are certain uh, processes and uh, files or keys which are specific to that uh, vendor. And as shown in this code, that it very specifically checks for Joey's box uh, server. And uh, these files are very specific to uh, Joey's uh, Sandbox. In order to create a, a sandbox, we can use a VMware, a virtual PC, a virtual a box. And all these applications, they have a very specific uh, processes and uh, services which are specific to them. So one of the very commonly used uh, technique is to enumerate all the processes and uh, services in a uh, sandbox. And once it has been at once, the code is being able to uh, locate the processes and uh, services, uh, which is uh, very specific to a virtual box, VMware, or a virtual PC. It will know that it is executing inside VMware, a virtual PC, and a virtual uh, box, and it can stop itself. In this case, like it uh, very specifically check for if a VM a mouse.sys is there. If it is being able to locate VM mouse.sys, then it is obvious that it is executing inside a VM fair and it can stop its execution. Okay, so we have a demo. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Trojan up clicker, it got activated only when the left mouse button is clicked. I think it got the oh, it's it working now. now right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. The, as shown in this uh, demo, the, when, uh, when we execute the code uh, malware.exe, absolutely nothing happens, which is obviously because the because the code is not executing inside a, a debugger. Uh, when we execute the code inside a debugger. As we can see that it starts executing. The code is uh, running, but there's no activity. Only when we click the left a mouse button, which is slightly tough to show, we can see the activity of the code, it starts. So, so basically the whole code is dependent upon the mouse activity. And a Trojan up clicker, it, injects itself in the SVC host, and after injection, it op opens the back door. And we can see that the it starts doing the activity. Okay. All right, thanks. 
so just you know to recap, right? All together, uh, you know, we classify all of these evasion techniques into four categories, right? So Abhishek went through this uh, human interaction, right, and uh, also the basically configuration, right, and also the classic evasion techniques. The next part I'm talking about is more of like you know on the environment part. So basically, each of the malware will require a specific environment to run, right? So it could be a malicious, uh, you know, exploit code, right? It will, it will basically target on a particular specific version of the vulnerable application or platform, right? But on the other side, file-based sandbox, you know, it's kind of like have just one environment over there, right? It, it has its own specific environment. When these two environments doesn't match, do not match, we got problems. So uh, the first uh, very common evasion here is basically version checks, right? So exploit, when they try to attack, they want to make sure they're running, you know, the target system is running the, you know, expected vulnerable application that they are looking for, right? So this is actually a case study, uh, you know, of a, Flash zero day happened in February 7th. We basically, I think, you know, this attack itself happened in 5th. And uh, it, got, it got published and then, you know, publicly, uh, you know, announced on 7th. So what, it, what it's doing here is actually to check for the versions of uh, basically the Adobe, um, you know, Flash player and make sure, you know, it will, it will run only on the targeted versions. So actually, let me run a survey here. So how many, how many of them, how many of you have this, uh, you know, flash player on your system? Many, I hope. <laughs> and uh, how many of you keep them updated all the time? How many just don't care? <laughs> Right, so for those of you who always keep, keep your system updated, congratulations, you are vulnerable to this exploit. <laughs> so basically, you know, but on the other side, uh, if you never upgrade, you'll be vulnerable to all of the, you know, kind of legacy exploits, right? So as you can see here, the exploit itself is very picky. They look for a particular environment. If in the file-based sandbox, you know, this system do not have this, uh, you know, particular versions listed here. You will never be able to trigger anything, right? So the same technique has been used, uh, you know, in a lot of attacks. The next example is actually something a little bit different. So we, we've seen some, uh, you know, malicious flash files over there, right? So this time, basically, the, they actually append this malicious content, as you can, as you can clearly see from this link here. Um, you know, at the, at the end of the, you know, f basically up to the footer area. So basically, this is the area that, you know, will never be interpreted by the Flash player or Windows viewer, right? So in this particular case, though, there is another piece of the malware that will load, read this information and execute it, right? So in this particular case, if the sandbox has only one file because you know how sandbox works is basically you throw in an object, right? It will whatever run for you and then give you the diff, right? What you have is only one file object. If you miss another part of this attack, you will not see any malicious activity. Another similar case here is, is actually a GIF file, right? So basically GIF file has header field, Right, you know, message, you know, content field, and also additional metadata field, and also the footers. Right, after the footer field, three, three B is the tag showing it is the end of a uh, GIF data stream, and basically all of the content after that is pretty much considered as a comment area. Right, again, no, uh, you know, basically common application here like the Windows viewer will will load this area and basically execute this code. So if you, again, have, has only one GF file over here, the file-based sandbox cannot interpret anything. And uh, here comes another uh, more complicated case. So 
Well, when we look at this case, it's actually very, very, very uh, impressive, I would say. Um, I think the, uh, the sweat actor behind this one is, is very creative and, uh, you know, cheerful, I would say. Um, so you will, you, will, you will see why I say that. So basically, first of all, there's this malicious payload over there, right? And uh, what we observe as the behavior of this uh, payload is basically a, a keep a keep going to this uh, harmless you know Chinese block site, right? And when we go to the block site, you see what I see here. It seems like you know there are just some some you know harmless uh, links over there, right? And it's even not clickable if you look at it, right? It has you know this uh, common thing like HXXP instead of HTTP. And uh, it turned out to be actually this is a link. For that, op for that basically payload to download this object. And uh, you may wonder, what is this object, right? And here we go. It is a Japanese, you know, cartoon figure. Nothing special, you know, you'll see what I see here, right? So then, you know, looking into this, uh, you know, cartoon hero picture, right? So after the end of image tag, uh, basically you will see an unknown padding field of uh, you know, 471 bytes. It's complete bar garbage over here, if you can see, right? Then this payload actually load this JPEG file, go to this unknown padding field, right? It will extract it and decrypt. Finally, that 471 bytes will turn into a INI file here, right? When you look at this file, it, it make a lot more sense to you. Right to me, right. As, so as you can see here, you know, it gave you all of these, uh, uh, you know, commands. And uh, what are these additional files for you to download? Right. So I guess now you will have a pretty good understanding of how this whole thing works. Right. Basically, th this this payload will go to the site, get a JPEG file, which is actually the the CNC command from the master. Right. It will execute this command and basically post another JPEG file up, which is also embedding all of this in this unknown padding field. Okay, and that communication keep going on. So what you see in your network is basically a whole bunch of these files. These are all the real JPEG exchanges over there. Very cheerful threat actor, I would say, right? Um, but so, as you can see here, right, if this uh, file-based sandbox, it is in a kind of like a true sandbox mode. Basically, it cannot talk out. That's the common configuration of the file-based sandbox, right? Basically, you will not allow it to go out to anywhere, right? Because, you know, you don't really want to run a malware in your sandbox and it, it launch some DOS attacks to White House and, you know, next day you got FBI knocking your door, hey, can we talk? So basically, in order to actually trigger all of these malicious activities, as you can see, a pure file-based sandbox is very limited, right? And this actually poses a fundamental issue here, which is, you know, for attacks like this, they're, they're stateful, right? You know, you will have to really understand the whole life cycle of a particular, you know, attack instead of just looking at one file in an isolated environment. Right, it is limited, right? So, um, then basically we went ahead and uh, you know, uh, run all of this malicious kind of like uh, examples over there uh, against some of the very uh, common or popular um, you know, online malware analysis systems, okay? And uh, each of them leverage sandbox technology, right? As you can see, none of them can be, well, none of them can be kind of like 100% bulletproof here, but you know, some, some, of, some of them are uh, you know, basically resistant to some of the visions, right? And that's the state of art, that's the reality now. That's what you have. So basically, we, we categorize each of these uh, you know, evasions and uh, you know, run this test. And hopefully, uh, we will basically, uh, you know, people can use this as a framework a comparison framework to help you better understand basically the sandboxes that you're using, right? You know, how effective they are 
and uh, you know, to also to help you better understand their limitations, right? So that when you are doing your research, um, you don't get fooled by this, uh, you, know, you know, malware with advanced, you know, evasion techniques. Um, so clearly, as we can see, right, um, you know, sandboxes, file-based sandboxes are definitely, you know, useful for researchers, right? It's a great diff tool. Basically, you throw something in, it gives you the, all of the changes that this, this object ever made to the system. It can help you to basically re, you know, research, reduce your research time. But on the other side, it is not a classification tool yet, right? By classification, I mean, you know, can it give you a result, right? Instead of giving you thousands of lines of activities, just tell me if it is malicious or not, right? So there's a long way to go. But uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of uh, you know, efforts, you know, both commercial and also open source, basically improving all of this, right? Uh, and uh, you know, on the other side though, I think, um, as you can see, for all of the evasions, right, some of them has been handled already. Um, that basically means you know, these uh, you know, communities are definitely improving their system, and that's great. So, we, we'd like to call for basic action that basically really need, uh, they need to have this uh, you know, hardening and uh, basically evasion resistant in mind, right? And also, sometimes it is very difficult to you actually you know, uh, you know, counter this evasion, right? So let's say, for example, there's a version check. How do you counter that, right? You will probably have to have uh, multiple different versions, right, trying them one by one, right? If you don't have the version, you don't have the version it will not run, right? And sometimes, basically, there's a sleep call. It's gonna sleep so, so long. But please let us know, right? So in your report, in the report of this, uh, you know, uh, sandbox result, let us know all of the suspicious ev possible evasion activities, at least, right? So it will be great if they can counter, but if you cannot, please also put this information out, like, you know, if there are, you know, extremely long sleep call, right, if you, if you terminate the process run because of sleep call, right, so things like that, give us more help, right, and um, also, I think, uh, I want to really kind of call out that this, this evasion things, they are definitely not kind of like, you know, fiction, uh, definitely not, so each of this, you know, Kileos, Push to and push I, each of them used a evasion technique that Abhishek just demoed previously, right? And uh, you know, most of the zero day attacks, most of the zero day attacks we've seen in the recent, uh, you know, couple, you know, several months, they all have this, uh, you know, version check and the environmental kind of like evasions over there, right? And uh, as you can see, um, overall, uh, Maybe like one year ago, uh, this, this sandbox vendors uh, figure out some of the evasion here. They put the code in and fix them, right? Um, and uh, this year there are more, right? And they are different. So each of this category, the reason why we want to put them in a the category is because, you know, they're actually, you know, what we present here is actually just some demo cases, right? There are almost like infinite possibility for the evasions to basically evolve. Let's say sleep calls, right? You can do sleep call, and I can take some actions to basically shortcut it, right? But then, okay, if you're shortcutting, the, mail, the malware writers are going to do this, uh, I'm gonna sleep short time frame, I mean short time period, but 5,000 times. How do you shortcut that, right? And even more, <laughs> Even more, they can basically just say, okay, so I'm gonna have a routine that's just doing complete garbage work, right? I'm not sleeping, I'm doing something, right? Like some of the corporate coworkers, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, there are, there are endless possibilities over there. So each of them, we wanna, we wanna describe these categories, right? And then encourage people to, to continue, to think continue, you know, along these lines, right? And uh, um, next is basically, um, you know, if you, if you remember all of these uh, environmental evisions over there, right, 
as you can clearly see, stateful is basically the, the middle name of all of the advanced attacks, right? Isolated sandbox system is definitely not the answer to address this uh, very complicated advanced malware threat. The modern malware threat landscape has been you know, evolved in, into this phase that, it, you know, I don't know how many of you were, were in the uh, 2004 DEF CON when um, this LSD group first announced the first, you know, Microsoft R MSRPC vulnerability, right? And uh, at, at that time, nobody, nobody dared to basically, you know, open up their Windows system. Within one, you know, just with one packet, your machine can get compromised. There's no state forcing at all, right? If you look at things, you know, pre, you know kind of like, it's all go, go all the way back to, let's say, you know, NIMDA, right? It's just one line of web request, and, you, and the server is compromised, right? But now it's more sophisticated. You will see this malicious file coming in, decoyed as a very innocent file. If you receive a file, pretend to be your boss, pretend to be from your boss, and say promotion letter, are you gonna open it or not? <coughs> right? And everything can be spoofed, as everybody know. So after this, there will be malware payload download, and all of the callback activities, like there's a cartoon you know, figures over there, it's all stateful. So my point here is that understanding the context is very important for us to basically fully decrypt, decipher this whole attack life cycle. So I think, you know, multi-flow and the multi-vector analysis, you know, on top of this, uh, you know, file-based sandbox basic technologies. So we'd like to basically make one point very clear, right? File-based sandbox is just a tool, right? It's like a knife or a gun. Basically, it is as good as the system that use it, or as, as good as the, you know, as the person who use it. It is, it, is, it is a tool. So in order to really address this you know, advanced malware issue, you need a system that can correlate all of the stateful behaviors of this attack. And uh, I'm not saying that's, you know, that's the silver bullet, but it is a never ending battle. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, open for questions. Thanks. <laughs>